Hello, everybody. We are live. Welcome to the Canadian Social. Uh, today is going to be an amazing show. I've got my co-host Renee here. Blaine is somewhere in the world. I don't know. We think he's in the air coming back from Manila. And then we are joined by the amazing Mel Duane. Hi, Mel. Hey, ladies. How are Thank you? Good. Thank you for joining us. Oh, yeah. I'm honored. This is going to be fun. It's going to be a blast. I'm super honored to have you here. I'm going to introduce Mel. I'm just going to read a little bit about her and then we're just going to dive into this. It's going to be awesome. So uh, through Mel's own experiences uh, of addiction, she has transformed her life and recreated herself as an awakened and highly successful businesswoman. She now helps women through midlife transitions to hear their broken hearts, reclaim their lives, and build success where they never thought possible. A best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and coach, she has been featured on Fox News, CBS Radio, and over 250 radio shows. She's a contributor to the Huffington Post, Mary Shriver, Healthy Living, and Aspire Magazine. And I have to tell you, I'm so excited to have her here. I have been privileged to be in Mal's Ripple through the Inspired Living family. And it has just been such a, like, I remember when I first met you, I was like, she is so fun. <laughs> Your energy is just so spunky. So I'm so grateful you're here today. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Tara. That's quite the bio, Mel. Oh, it's been quite the journey, Renee, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I bet. I'm excited to hear your story. I'll let Tara take the lead here. I love well, your I, baby. I love oh, that baby. Thank you. He's my youngest. Yes, he likes <laughs> to make appearances on occasion. <laughs> so... Mel, I, I really want to dive in. Like I've got, like I say, you have been in my ripple for a couple years now, and so. But I, you know, there's things I've always heard about you, and I'm like, I want to know more about all this juicy goodness. Um, I know you have a, you built a real estate company. I think you were an actress back in the day. You've mentored with Dr. Wayne Dyer. Um, so can you tell me how? I, and, and actually, you're multiple best-selling author. Uh, I know you have another book coming up too. We'll talk about. Um, can you tell us like where your journey? began well my journey began at the age of 15 when I had no sense of self-worth no self-confidence throwing down Colt 45 malt liquor beers as fast as I could three of them and I was off and running I was flying and that feeling got its hooks into me at a very young age that was the band-aid for the wound for the pain that i could absolutely not tolerate that pain of not feeling that i could be me and that me wasn't good enough and alcohol became my best friend at a very young age sadly and that and that went on for from the age of 16 to the age of 41. Mm -hmm. so honestly i lost 25 years of my life in this kind of drunken haze, train wreck of a period. I mean, there were some bright moments in that time, but most of it was really very dark. And I got to a point uh, when I was 41 that I didn't have another, not one more day in me to continue doing what I was doing. I knew I was at the end of the line and I was planning to die. I just said, I can't do this anymore. I would be better off dead. And in that dark night of the soul, when I was ready to go take my own life, I heard a different voice for the very first time in my life. And that voice said to me, oh no, <laughs> you cannot go now. You need to, you have lessons to learn. You need to master those lessons. And when you do, you will go and teach others. All of a sudden, mm. I'm like, oh, God, am I having a massive breakdown or am I hearing <laughs> something that really makes sense and I need to listen to? And it wasn't about ego or any of that. It was, hey, you can't go. You need to learn something. Well, that was the beginning of a whole new journey. That was the beginning of recovery. And that was 30 years ago. Um, the next day. 
I went running over to a neighbor that I had that looked like Paul Newman, and he was a biggie in recovery. And I was like, hey, George, George, I need to go to a meeting with you. And he was like, that's good. I've been holding a chair for you now for a couple of years. <laughs> he said, I'm glad you finally showed up. That was the Aww. beginning. Yeah, that was the beginning. And I'll tell you, and I, I said this earlier today in a show that I did, there is nothing as orgasmic, as blissful, as joyful as being in recovery. Nothing even compares to it. The success and everything I've created since I've been sober is so amazing compared to the way I used to live. There's just no comparison. Mm. Wow. So what what was what was the next step? Was so were you did all this business stuff come after that point? Or yes. was it some yeah? Oh. So I was I was in real estate before I got sober, but never created the business that I have today um, that I built until I was in recovery. And so the first thing I did was obviously to stop drinking, but that's not really what recovery about. Recovery is facing the pain, facing the trauma, doing the inner work, digging deep, figuring out what do I need to change so that I can live in recovery. I mean, drinking was only a Band-Aid. I had to figure out the wound, what was crazy, all, causing all the crazy thinking, because once I got sober, I realized my own thinking is what caused all my suffering. And if I couldn't change that thinking, then nothing was going to change for me. Yeah, I might be sober, but my life really wasn't going to change. So it was mm -hmm. really digging in, getting under the hood and figuring all that out. And I started a spiritual practice of meditation and journaling. And then I started connecting with different spiritual teachers. And I loved what I was hearing and what I was reading and how I was feeling. It, it was igniting my soul. And I knew I was on the right path. Wow. So who was, the, who was the first person that kind of influenced your journey into the spiritual healing? Louise Hay. Louise. Uh, yeah. Louise and um, uh, Ruth Fischel. Ruth was very big in the recovery community and um, had several books out. I read her books and then I got introduced to Louise and started reading Louise's material and her mm -hmm. language just brought me such comfort. And then through Louise, I tapped into Wayne Dyer and I studied with Wayne for many, many years and was blessed to be out in Maui with him at like the last live event he did before he passed. Wow. I got goosebumps on that one. He was, he was amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. And, and taught me so much about how divine we really are as human beings. And we never lose that. It only gets clouded over from life's mm -hmm. experiences. And we just need to wipe the lenses off and the vision comes back and we can tap back into that very easily. Yeah. So Mel, what then led you um, from real estate into coaching? I mean, I'm sure all this mentorship and these, you know, all this was a build up towards it. Can you talk a little bit about that? A little bit about that. Yeah. Well, you know what? I I really created a very successful business on nothing from a shoe. You know, just from nothing. I just I created a a business based on surpassing my clients' expectations, and so that just multiplied my business every year. Uh, people just from word of mouth and referral and past clients saying, oh my gosh, what this woman did. And, and, and I've used that principle now in almost everything I do, even surpassing my own expectations about doing things. So I got to a point, I said, gee, you know what? I have learned a lot about law of attraction, self-mastery, building a business, 
creating things, manifesting. I need to share all this good stuff with women <clears throat> before I leave this planet. So I decided to write a book. The first book I wrote was Alpha Check. And that talked about the journey of addiction and recovery and the tools I used to create success in my life. And that's how it started. And that when that book came out, it started a lot of conversation, a lot of interviews, appearances. And from that point, I said, you know, any woman that wants to have that conversation with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm here. I will teach you. I will share with you exactly what I did so that you can replicate it. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. I know um, <clears throat> I've been in real estate in the past. And... I struggled. I wasn't in the spiritual end of it before then or kind of on my journey, but I really struggled with the end of the business where it's all about money and it's a very money driven industry. And for myself, I did commercial real estate. So it was just on a different level, but it, uh, yeah, that's one thing I really struggled with. How do you balance living an authentic life and being present and doing the coaching like you do and keeping that softness to you in such a hard, money-driven, male-driven industry? Well, before I got sober, um, I would say that when I was working, I had the dollar signs in the eyes. So it was about the next deal, the next transaction, the next sale, rushing people along, pushing them. Once I was in recovery and started to do the inner work on myself, mm -hmm. I realized that success was more than just money. It was being passionate about what you do. Yeah. And I started to build a business that was really a pioneer in technology. I was using computers and had um, MLS on my website and was doing virtual tours before anybody knew what that stuff was all about. Mm -hmm. And that just put me on a whole different level, a whole yeah. different playing field when it came to real estate. And I started to embrace clients like they were family like they were my friends and treated them with love and care it was no longer about how much i was going to be paid it was about how happy you're going to be in your new home or how happy you're going to be with the sale of your current residence yeah. and we're going to make this transaction seamless and easy so that you can move to where you're going to Mm -hmm. So my focus changed completely. It was on the client and how happy they would be at the end of the business transaction. Yeah. I love that. I do too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know my, I've always loved real estate. It's actually like a quirky little hobby of mine. I like to read the monthly statistics and it's just for years. It's something that I've always loved to do. And with renovations and, you know, moving, you know, it, it's, it's just been in, in my life. So I love that because I've had the privilege of working with a realtor myself and she's the same. She cares along the way. And I think that's why since my babies were little, I've stuck with the same one. So I can appreciate that because mm -hmm. I've heard many stories from people in the industry where it is just very that money driven thing. So yeah. I have clients that I've done four or five and six transactions with and all their family members and now their kids. I mean, and that's just such a validation that they value me and it makes me even more passionate to help them. Well, and it then becomes more about relationship building than it is, you know, about the process, like you said. Right. So I think that's incredible. And I think if every industry, people in any industry could go about their business with that goal in building relationships, I think the world would just be a happier place. <laughs> yeah. when, when we come from a place of serving mm -hmm. rather than taking, yeah, <clears throat> it's, it, the client feels it. They yeah. recognize that. And then yeah. they're on board much faster. For sure. Business with you. 
So for our guests, I don't know if Tara, I don't think you mentioned, where in the US are you? I'm just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. About 20, 25 minutes outside the city. Nice. That is but a gorgeous city. I have not traveled there yet myself, but I hope to one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Boston's absolutely. nice. It's got a lot going on. It does. Yeah. 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 So with your spiritual journey and dealing with, you know, Wayne Dyer and some of these types of, I mean, most of us read the book and we, we watch them on TV or on documentaries, but we never actually get to work one-on-one -on -one with these types of people. And how is that experience for you? Magical, absolutely magical. The, um, the last time I was with Wayne, he was at such a, a, a point in his life of elevated consciousness. The only way to describe it is that he really was like Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. And when he spoke to us, I felt such a, a divine connection. I, I, and, and I don't know if your listeners are spiritual or religious, but for me, it was like mm -hmm. God was speaking to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came back from that event really a, a, at a new level in my own life and, a, and a, a new level of appreciation for what we can do as human beings mm -hmm. in our own lives and the ripple that we can put out to touch other people's lives and to lift them up. Yeah. That's and just I, so well said. <laughs> it is, and I think it's so important, you know? And I think the one thing I really appreciate with this journey and the working on yourself, and it's work only that you can do. You can't take a pill to feel better. You can't just attend a service on Sunday to feel better. And nothing against, you know, religion. I was brought up in a very religious family, but it just, you actually have to do the work and you are actually accountable. And I think, you know, seeing someone like yourself who has come out of recovery and, or is, you know, forever in recovery from addiction. I don't, I don't think addiction is necessarily just isolated to alcoholism or drug use. I think yeah. in our society today, we do numb with so many things, yeah. you know, even technology and all the rest of it. And, and I think it's so important to look at life as what can I recover from? Like what, what is holding me back and numbing me? So I think it's really neat to see your journey and see that you're still going on it. When my first book came out, I talked about the fact that I think women, we all are recovering from something. Mm -hmm. Just in the, the research I did on that book, talking to women and different support groups I went to, if it, if it wasn't alcohol or, or, or drugs, it was men, it was shopping, mm -hmm. um, it was self, for me also self-condemnation. I was terribly hard on myself, very judgmental. As I said, my, my own thinking caused my suffering. It wasn't the trauma and the bad things I experienced. It was the things that I kept rethinking and rethinking and rethinking about those things mm -hmm. that held me hostage for so many years. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting when you say that because, you know, as we, we, we were actually talking a little bit earlier about the mindfulness thing and how important those practices are in, you know, for me, I know mantras or power words or things that kind of help to regain that focus um, are such great tools to implement on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, Mel, do you find uh, with, with working with women that um, when we talk about blocks and barriers and things that hold them back, is there something that you've noticed like a pattern over the years um, where, where we, we get held back and we, you know, instead of that, that fear factor, I guess, of holding us back versus going, okay, let's step forward and just see or trust. I have never met a woman that hasn't struggled with self-worth. Mm -hmm. We all have it. And it's conditioning. It happens when we're children. Um, you know, it's funny. We come to this planet as perfect little beings. We are untouched by anything. We are clean slates. We get here. We arrive. We're blissful little packages. And then we meet our parents. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, <laughs> not that they're not good people. Okay. I'm not saying they're not good, not but they start having a lot of impact very early on in our lives. And we start taking on their stories, their beliefs, their concepts, which were passed on to them. Mm -hmm. and, and we, and those things start to create filters. They start to create the way we judge things. They start to create the way we feel about ourselves. And the next thing you know, we're off and running. Um, and we're no longer that authentic, wonderful little child that came here without any hangups that would, you know, pick her nose and fart in front of people. Now we're so <laughs> uptight that, you know, we're beginning to feel like worthless for no reason at all, just because of all the stuff we've taken on from all the people. And it's not, it's, just, it's not excluded to our parents. It's our siblings. It's the kids we play with. It's Johnny in the third grade. It's that friend in the fifth grade that all of a sudden doesn't like you anymore. And then you become a teenager and people make fun of you and they call you flat chested or skinny or pimple puss. And it goes on and on and on. And you know what? It's, it's, it's like a collection of crap that we take on <laughs> and that's our new yeah. identity. Thank you world. Mm. Yep. <laughs> and none of us escape that. It's part of no. the journey. <clears throat> so Mel, I know that you've tra you do a lot of traveling. I you were recently in India. Um, how has travel and those experiences influenced and helped to shape um, you know, the person that you've become today because it can have a big effect on us all. Well, I went to India in February of this past winter, so 2018, and I went right at the midpoint when I was writing my book. So I started the book on December 1st, and I went on February 15th to India. I wanted validation that what I was doing, I was meant to do, and that what I was writing about was the message I was meant to deliver. And I was standing in front of the Taj Mahal asking this question. And it was like the earth was vibrating. I was in this field of energy and of love that I can, I don't have words to describe the magnificence of the Taj Mahal, but it is the largest man-made tribute to love on this planet, the most exquisite place ever. And I'm asking this question about, am I delivering the message I'm meant to deliver? And I got such validation that the book that I needed to write was coming through me. Mm -hmm. And just get out of the way and all will be well. And I came home and finished the book in like three months. It was the easiest book I've ever written. Um, it, was, it, it, was, it was so easy compared to the first one that I kept saying, maybe it's Maybe I didn't do a good job. Maybe it's maybe it's not right. You know, it was like it was too smooth. It was with such ease and grace. So I love to go to spiritual places. I travel so that I can take courses from teachers that I love. So that's usually what inspires where I go. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Miranda McPherson. It might be. Um, Wayne, when he was still alive, uh, you know, um, um, many of the Hay House authors. Um, oh, I'm having, I'm, I'm having. You were, you, well, you were at Tony Robinson recently too. Oh, I remember yes, I saw I pictures. Tony, yeah, I was at Tony Robbins uh, in the spring of mm. 2017. I mean, I go all over and I take classes mm. everywhere, and I love it because I love to learn. Life is a classroom. This is what I've figured out in my old age. This whole experience that we're having is strictly a classroom. Yeah. And it's all about lessons. And the lessons, some are painful and some are blissful. The painful ones are meant to open us up, to expand us, and to teach us the lessons we need to learn so that we don't keep repeating these same mistakes lifetime after lifetime. Mm -hmm. There was one Carolyn Miss book I wrote and it was part of our curriculum for school and it was Sacred Contracts. Oh. And that one, <clears throat> it took me a bit, I love her work. 
like mm-hmm. how to heal your life or heal your life is just amazing. And in that anatomy of the spirit is probably my favorite, but mine too. <laughs> sacred contracts kind of took my mind a little bit to work around because I was brought up very Pentecostal and, and this whole, you make contracts prior to coming into your body, but man, does it make you really appreciate the lessons and the struggles that you go through and trying to find the right way through them. Because obviously this is part of the journey that I signed up for. Yes. So it, it just brought a whole new accountability to the journey. And I think like, the lessons that she, you know, the writings and the lessons that she brought through in that book, it just made so much sense to so much. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know, it really did. As as women, we make soul contracts, and I'll share a very personal story. Mm-hmm. Um, my book that's coming out in this spring, uh, Broken Open, is about this. I got married in two thousand three. Yeah, I uh, had a previous marriage as a young woman and to another alcoholic and I got divorced and I stayed single for 18 years. Mm. And then I met this man and I wasn't looking for a husband, but I knew that I needed, he asked me to marry him and I knew I needed to do that. Mm. I knew that there was some type of soul contract between us. I thought it was for the rest of my life, but I was wrong. He was here to teach me a lesson and to help me to heal the last remnants of of things that that needed to be dealt with. And Mm -hmm. so there was a terrible betrayal in the marriage, which ultimately caused the end of the marriage. Mm -hmm. Even though I tried to work with him for a year or so to, see if we could save it. And what I learned as I was deep in my pain that no matter what he did had nothing to do with my value as a woman. Mm -hmm. It was something that was missing in him. It was something that he needed to heal within him. And that was the outcome of this experience. He is working on something that he needed to heal with him that was very dark and very painful. And what it did was it, it, it brought to light for me that I needed to heal within me, honoring my own gut feelings, my own intuition, and not dismissing them and thinking that I'm being insecure or not speaking up when I feel uncomfortable, honoring myself you know, in a situation where I need to express myself. Mm-hmm. So it was a massive healing for both of us. Yeah. It was a soul cr- contract that needed to be done. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, Mel, um, because, you know, at the Canadian Social, we love to talk about how people give back uh, to communities in different ways. And you started, uh, I think you had mentioned in 2006, the Catherine Holy School uh, in West Africa. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I built this wonderful little school in Mali, West Africa. It educates 100 children every year. And wow. it's uh, 50% boys, 50% girls, who would never, ever, ever have the opportunity for education. And I built the school in memory of my niece who passed away. And she was a shining light. She was, and she still is. I see her in the sky when I look up. I see this little star and I know it's her. Uh-huh. And actually the anniversary of her death is coming up in a couple of weeks next week. And so um, because she loved education and she loved children and she was studying to be, uh, she was in law school and wanted to be a legal advocate for children. I said, what better way can I honor her than to build a school that would educate children? Because that's really what she was all about. That was her, her passion, her purpose. And I felt that I needed to support that and do something 
that would honor that. And that's how the school came about. That's amazing. Yeah, truly you know, it, amazing. It's so funny how people don't realize, you know, you hear from people, oh, well, I can't make a difference. I can't, I'm just one person. Every amazing act starts with just one person, you know, doing something small or big. And I think that is phenomenal, especially in educating in an area where that obviously isn't so available. Yeah. Every day, I try to make a difference in a woman's life mm -hmm. every day. And it may be just posting a supportive message in Facebook when somebody's hurting or they've lost a loved one, or it may be donating something locally to a women's breast cancer uh, organization, uh, something I'm going to on Sunday, it's called Chemo Puffs and they're little bags of cosmetics and toiletries for women. Uh, and just, you know, giving a bunch of those for women that are in treatment or donating clothes to a shelter. Uh, this year, I'm mentoring some young women that live in um, housing for women that are really depressed financially. And I'm mentoring a group of them in business skills, uh, you know, to help them do resumes, become uh, techno savvy with computer skills, things like this. Uh, there's so much that we all can do as individuals mm -hmm. that don't require a lot of money or what, you know, building a school was expensive, but there were things that we can do that aren't expensive yeah. that support one another and just bring a little joy into somebody else's life, a little comfort, uh, a kind gesture, and that's what the world needs now. Mm -hmm. We need more kindness. We need more support helping one another because this place is getting out of hand. We've had another terrible situation in, this, in the United States of another mass shooting. Mm -hmm. And it, it breaks my heart that this goes on. So that's what inspires me in any way that I can do good. Let me do good. Let me stand up and support people. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think women face, and maybe men do too, um, we face a different issue in the sense that, especially when you have children and, you know, if you've been home raising your children, you lose this giant sense of yourself. And I think, you know, if you can just share love to others, just to help them see how amazing they are. It, it doesn't cost anything, you know? And it's like the meme that you see all over Facebook these days, let's straighten each other's crowns. And it, it, it doesn't take much to do it. And I think you're so right on with the, you know, if you can do something small for another woman, every woman is your tribe, you know? I'm uh, very accessible, very open. Uh, I have women that reach out to me from all over the globe with issues, problems, relationship issues. Mm -hmm. I personally respond to them. There's no VA handling that communication. Someone's really suffering, I'll say, give me your phone number, I'll call you. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about this, because I don't want to see you in pain. Mm -hmm. I know what pain looks like. I walked in those shoes for way too long. And um, as I said, I'm, I'm guilty for my own suffering and for the pain I felt. But boy, if I can do some simple things to help another woman get out of pain, I am all in. There is nothing that will stop me. Yeah. So I know I'm going to butt in Tara again. Sorry. I know. <laughs> One thing Blaine always likes to ask and one thing, you know, we love to hear is you've talked a lot about helping women and that that sounds like that is kind of your sole purpose is, is to help women. But if you could leave one thing or be remembered for one thing in this world, what would it be? Or would it be that? The one thing I'd want to be remembered for was that I was kind. Mm -hmm. Honest and kind. Because I think those are two of my absolute core values. Mm 
Yeah. I there's no reason not to be kind. Yeah. It doesn't cost anything. It's just a matter of choice. You can be an asshole or you can be kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's conscious Ooh. choice. Yeah. Yep. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. I hope I didn't say something bad. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's all okay. good. You said anything goes. <laughs> I mean, anything is clean, you know. I mean, really. <laughs> I can have a lot worse. Just fire me up a little bit. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no. We we do like to have a little bit of fun too. And so I I would just be have you have you been to Canada, Mel? I have, but not in a long time. I was in whoops, I just lost an earbud. I was in <laughs> um uh in uh Toronto, and I saw um, Bob, oh my God, the big law of attraction guy, uh, Bob, um, older gentleman, white hair, oh my God. Proctor, Bob Proctor. Proctor. Yes, I was in Toronto, saw Bob Proctor mm -hmm. with uh, another fellow who at the time was a, a really kind of um, hot real estate coach he, on the scene, and uh, but I loved Bob Proctor. And um, that was the last time I was there. Oh, wait a minute. No, I went to Montreal for New Year's Eve when I was married. And they had an ice storm. Oh, Jesus. I was staying at the Ritz-Carlton, and they, they was an ice storm. And I went out the door of the hotel, and I just slid all the way down the sidewalk. And I just kept going and going. And my husband was trying to catch me, and his feet were just flying in the air. And I was, I, I couldn't grab anything. It was wild. I finally, like, got a hold of a lamppost. And that kept me from, like, going down a hill. It was the craziest thing. You couldn't go anywhere for two days. The city was a sheet of ice. So I haven't been to that quickly, okay? <laughs> I just want to say hi to Linda. I see she's here. And she, oh. uh, she to your comment, she had said, Mel, so true. We always have the choice to be kind. Yeah. Oh. There's another oh. one of my doctors. Oh. <laughs> there we go, Chris. Yeah, Bob Proctor, when he spoke at Young Living Convention. Mm -hmm. I Bob was one of the first ones I started to learn about the whole paradigm shift with. So I really, I'm a kind of a big Bob fan too. So a wonderful man. <laughs> So Mel, uh, in regards to Canada, if you could give us like three words that you think of when you think of Canada, what what, what would that be? <laughs> and it can be anything. Ah. Hockey. Always, hockey. They always have a great <laughs> hockey team. Freaking cold. <laughs> <laughs> too too cold for my skinny ass. <laughs> and um. Great accents. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> Love Canadian accents. Love them. Yeah. We don't, you know, it's funny. We don't think of ourselves as having yeah. an accent, but. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, for me, whenever I talk to a Canadian, I can always tell. I'll say, what part of Canada are you from? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Mel, this has been so much fun having you here today. A, <laughs> Crystal says A. <laughs> a. Oh, A. It's been oh, fun. You know, the a. other thing was my mink cat. I bought the greatest mink cat in Canada. It's like a hunting <laughs> cap with the flaps. Yeah. <laughs> One, I look like I'm going to go out, you know, and look for moose or something, and I have this funny hat on. That, that's the fourth thing I, I think about with Canada. We all own one of those too. Oh, yeah. 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 And we do actually wear them. So I wear we them sometimes. <laughs> it's like that minus 40 with a wind chill. You're right. It's too cold here. Maybe I'll need to call you up and just fly in down and you can show me some real estate yeah. <laughs> in some warmer places. Uh. <laughs> Come on, be yeah. awesome. uh, Mel, I know you also have a free gift on your website and can we let everybody know where they can find you? Just go to malduanecoach.com and I think right now it's a video series uh, about really how to connect to your heart and the five steps that I use um, for creating transformation in your life. Really simple, um, but very clear and absolutely have great impact on letting go of limiting beliefs and tapping into who you really are as a divine woman. Awesome, I love that. And we will absolutely drop the links below for everybody too, to find you. And when can we expect Broken Open to be coming out? 
Oh boy. April 17th, 2019. I'll be birthing a new baby. Woohoo! Having a oh. baby at 71. Oh my God. <laughs> it's gonna, this could be painful. <laughs> you look amazing for 71. Thank you. You know, I feel great. I feel great. And that's mindful living. That's, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of myself, eating well, staying out of the sun, exercising, um, having the support of, you know, a sisterhood like Linda. I just came back from a beautiful retreat with her. Uh, I have so many good things in my life mm -hmm. that that's what keeps me going, keeps me young, keeps me, you know, high energy. So I'm very thankful. That's amazing. Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, I look um, forward to getting my hands on this book. It sounds very exciting. I'm super oh. excited to read this book. <laughs> and, uh, look, at, I am so happy to come back and we'll have a conversation about the lessons in that book because they are profound. I was, I was just going to say, we are going to have to have you back once this book comes out. So <laughs> Love it. That would yeah. be Absolutely love it. Uh, it is. Thank you. Yeah, Gussie agrees. <laughs> you should, we should have had yours here too. They could have said hello. I know. Hannah would be barking at Gussie. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Daddy. Uh, well, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Yes, it has been amazing thank having you. you here today. Thank you for sharing your story and your journey. Um, it, yeah, it's truly amazing. It's congratulations on all your success and mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. I love to bring a Just little hope. <laughs> I love to bring a little hope, inspire women mm -hmm. to step up into all that they can be. That's what life's about. Mm -hmm. Do you think yeah, you'll ever? Do you think you'll ever stop, or is you're just gonna keep on going? Keep going. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Yep. If I stopped, I could get into such trouble. I could be sitting in a pool with a guy that's 30 years younger, slamming down <laughs> dinkeries. And I just want to talk about trouble. <laughs> I used to be a major cougar. I've cleaned up my act. But once upon a time, we go, girl. <laughs> that was one chapter. That was one chapter. <laughs> no, I don't write about that one too much. <laughs> You're gonna have to do one of those pen name books and write some kind of like <laughs> what a novel. <laughs> uh, well. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today here on the Canadian Social. Renee, I'll let you do Blaine's part since he's somewhere in the sky. <laughs> Heard us, share us, comment, like <laughs> us, like Mel's page. We value your time and thank you for joining <laughs> us from here in Canada. Thank you so much. Bye, Canada and the rest of the world. <laughs> See you next time.